Today, we're gonna watch What If The Soviets Join The Axis. Let's watch. Hey guys, so this channel was actually recommended from uh, many people. Um, you know, I said I wanna I wanna niche down my videos. I wanna talk about you know either history or geography or something else, but I wanna niche down so my audience doesn't have to watch multiple different types of videos. And one of the channels that was recommended was this one, uh, Monsieur C, and this video. So, what if the Soviets joined the Axis? First of all, w w could that really happen? Would have that really happened? Uh, yes, they have the whole, uh, I don't remember the name of the treaty or the pact, but you know, uh, the one where they divided Poland. So they had this little alliance, but I think, as I understand, Stalin was very aware that Hitler was extremely anti-communist and Hitler was very anti-communist. So what if that really happened? Could we really see a, 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 a scenario where the Soviets joined the Axis? I don't know. I, I, I can't. I can't see it. But again, I think there's more of a more of a alternate history scenario. So let's so, the watch. The two most famous alliances in history are the competing sides of World War II. On one side stood the Allies, and I'm gonna eat just Britain and France. Because I, I I I love eating while watching videos, so I hope you guys don't mind. And I'm really glad that I'm not the only one that likes this kind of stuff. France, later joined by the USSR and the USA. On the other side stood Germany and Italy, supported in Asia by the Empire of Japan. These factions also included smaller players such as Greece, Hungary, and China to name a few. But the Big Seven are, of course, the most recognizable. Britain and France had entered into the contest under the pretense of defending Poland's independence upon its invasion by Germany. However, for months, little to no fighting occurred, and eventually, Germany ultimately succeeded in conquering France in just a matter of weeks. This left only Britain, Six still obliged weeks, to fight on behalf of freeing France and Poland, as well as standing by Churchill's promise to accept nothing short of total victory over Germany. After France had fallen, Italy, seeing an opportunity, threw its support behind Germany and began its own territorial expansion in North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. The Italians, although they had built up an official alliance with Germany in the past decade, weren't truly devoted to the Germans until this victory over France. Prior to this, Italy had played around with the idea of building alliances with Britain and France, as well as Spain and Portugal, in what was meant to be a bloc shared on Roman roots. As was the case for many states involved in the war, the ultimate faction they chose to align with wasn't set in stone as most might think. For a time, Italy had even been convinced that the US would support their and Germany's alliance given perceived ideological similarities between them and FDR's administration, oh, as well as conflicting interests oh, with Britain, who at the time held colonial possessions in the Caribbean and in Canada, right on America's doorstep. Perhaps most interesting, however, is the dynamic which existed between Germany and Russia. Germany, in the build-up to the war, had expressly declared that the Soviet Union and communism as its greatest enemy. Because of this, many in the West had assumed that the two would naturally wind up warring with each other, but instead, a non-aggression pact was established, spheres of influence in Eastern Europe were drawn, and a joint invasion of Poland was launched. Recognizing how foolish it would be to portray Russia right after Britain and France had just declared war, Germany, rather than expose itself to a two-front conflict, defeated France and isolated Britain. Only then did Germany turn its attention to the East and open up a new front before the Soviets could grow Operation Barbarossa. Of course, this ultimately backfired for Germany upon the US's entry into the war. This tilted the balance of power in favor of the Allies and allowed the eventual breaching of the continent through Italy and the coast of Normandy. But while it's easy to just assume that a betrayal was inevitable upon conflicting ideology, we must ask why Germany resorted to this hasty decision when just two months prior, the two had appeared to be forging positive relations, so much so that legitimate efforts were made by both sides to welcome the Soviet Union into the Axis. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the subsequent invasion of yeah, Poland had done more than facilitate a single joint military action. It laid the groundwork for future German and Soviet cooperation and partnership by dividing Eastern Europe between them, providing an opportunity for Germany to control Lithuania and the Balkans, while the Soviets would subjugate the remaining Baltic nations, Bessarabia and Finland. Both Germany and, and that Russia didn't happen. recognized during the opening of the Western Front that war between their own countries would be disastrous. Germany, because it would need to fight a two-front war, and the Soviets, because they stood woefully unprepared. As such, 
it was determined that the continuation of Russo-German peace was ideal, an enduring peace which lasted at least one decade was possible if a degradation of relations was avoided. To assure this outcome, it was decided that the USSR must become a member of the Axis and share in the post-Britain world order. Progress was made, and the Soviets did seem enthusiastic. However, debate broke out over the status of the Balkans and Finland. The Soviets had been promised Finland if they were to... I mean, let's look, let's look at this that way. Most of the German soldiers were fighting on the, uh, gosh, I don't know if it's East and West, guys. I'm really bad with directions, but let's call it the Russian front, right? I mean, Operation Barbarossa started out with, I think, 3 million soldiers. So that's a lot. And the Soviet Union, that destruction, which you could call it the main front, uh, helped the allies like the U.S., the U.K., Canada land in Normandy and, and, and defeat Germany that way. But if Germany didn't fight the Soviet Union, I mean, just the amount of sheer power that Germany would have had, I don't think they could have landed in France. Like, there's simply no way. So it's interesting. I think Germany could have won. Join the Axis. However, Germany had become dependent on Finnish resources during the war and was hesitant to allow the Soviets to interfere with that. Germany and the USSR had already established a strong, mutually beneficial trade relationship during and even preceding the conflict. The Soviets provided the Germans a great deal of agricultural and raw materials, while the Germans provided the Soviets with heavy machinery. Going off of this codependent strategy, the Soviets had promised to continue delivering Finnish resources to Germany until the war was concluded. However, Germany refused, asserting that a Russian conquest of Finland at the time would risk the destruction of necessary Finnish assets, and thus, Finland remained an unresolved issue between the two countries. Additionally, there is the matter of the Balkan coast. The Soviets had wished to consolidate authority there in order to re-secure the Black Sea as Russia's personal naval harbor. Germany, as per the terms of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, granted to Russia Romania's Bessarabian lands, but resisted additional annexations. These proposals only made Germany more suspicious of the Soviet Union's intentions, and believed that the USSR may be preparing for a westward invasion while Germany was preoccupied with Britain. This was exacerbated by the apparent attempts by the Soviets to sway Bulgaria over to their side. The USSR's final proposition to Germany for its own entry into the Axis required two major conditions. First, a total withdrawal of German troops from Finland and a pact of mutual assistance between Russia and Bulgaria, who was also interested in joining the alliance. In the end, however, the proposal was ignored outright, Russia never receiving a response to this offer while Bulgaria was accepted into the Axis. Not long after receiving this proposal, Germany, seeing partnership with the Soviets as no longer reasonable, began to work on Operation Barbarossa, a plan that was meant to speedily defeat Russia and seize its resources by force, using them to facilitate a consolidation of power in the West and the ultimate defeat of Britain. But instead, Operation Barbarossa spread the German army thin, and upon the entry of the US into the conflict, allowed the Allied powers to breach the coast of should have learned. Should have read about Napoleon, my dude. Italy and Normandy, marking the beginning of the end for the German war effort. But what if that changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, the Germans and the Soviets ended up working together? Oh, but let's shit. suppose that Hitler accepted Soviet domination over Finland on the condition that the major resource deposits Germany was reliant on were safe from destruction and continue to be supplied to Germany at little to no cost until the end of the war. From there, the Soviet Union would become an official member of the Axis and work side by side with Germany, Italy... I mean, it's game over, bro. Like, what would have happened? What could have the Allies done with an, a German-Soviet alliance plus Italy and Japan who were also kind of strong? Like, it's game over. ...in Japan. Now that Hitler has the Soviets on his side, he can focus his entire attention to Western Europe. In the first few years of the war, Hitler's campaign would be similar to our timeline, where he blitzes through much of Western Europe and coerces Eastern Europe into the Axis. Along with that, Greece would likely join the Allies by this point. This is because the Greek government would realize that they're next on the Italian chopping block and would want Allied support. Soon after, the Soviets and the British would invade Iran, with the Soviets occupying the northern half and the British occupying the south. With mainly in Europe wholly under Axis control, Germany can focus entirely on the planned invasion of Britain itself, 
Operation Sea Lion, an operation which, in our world, was scrapped in favor of Operation Barbarossa, which Germany anticipated would provide them with the added resources and security necessary to outlast the British. Instead, with the Soviets fully cooperative, that wouldn't be an issue this time around. As Operation Sea Lion commenced, the Soviet Union would begin their own conquest of Finland. Using their experience from the Winter War, the Soviets would learn from their enemy and train their troops to detect camouflage Finnish troops. In fact, much of the Soviets' fight against Finland would be in a guerrilla-style conflict, with both sides making great use of camouflage in the snow while slowly picking off the others. After about a year of fighting, the Soviets, using their massive military, would launch an all-out assault on Finland and capture Helsinki. In order to stave off rebellion, the Soviets likely wouldn't annex all of Finland, but would leave pro-Soviet leaders in charge that take orders directly from Moscow. In the east, Japan would be plowing through Asia just like in our timeline. They would conquer eastern China, southeastern Asia, and the Indies just like in our timeline, but would leave the Philippines alone. It's not that the Japanese didn't want to take the Philippines for themselves, it's just that they didn't want to anger the US too early in the war, when the situation is still volatile for them. Well, Japan I mean, but if this really possible though they 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 attacked pearl harbor for a reason not only because of the philippines but other colonies like guam and and other islands that shit i i, I don't remember their names guys but that's part of it and and two the oil embargo that the u.s was enforcing in japan that was also part of it so you know I don't know if this would have actually happened because if they could have just ignored America, they would have done it in the first place. They wouldn't attack Pearl Harbor because, has it, you know, let's just, oh, ignore the Philippines, don't attack Hawaii, and take everything else. But that's not possible, I think, but I know. Japan would still be facing fuel shortages, just like in our timeline. It wouldn't be that pressing of an issue for them. The reason behind this is their new alliance with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had one of the largest proven oil reserves in the world, with some of it all right yep yeah. he just solved the question actually being sent to the allies in our timeline in this timeline since japan would need oil it wouldn't hurt the russians to export some of it to japan during their conquest of the pacific well the japanese would be looking to take the philippines and australia just like in our timeline they would have another major target that being india the only reason oh, why japan shit. Never attempted a full-scale invasion of india in our timeline was because they saw it as a stretch of their already low number of resources in this timeline with japan having secured soviet oil and the british navy preoccupied with fighting the germans the Japanese might set their sights on the subcontinent. This actually isn't that far off from our timeline, as the Japanese actually invaded Burma with the intention to push deep into India. This actually isn't that far off from our timeline, as the Japanese actually invaded Burma with the intention to push deep into India. In this timeline, that goes Shed further, the with the Japanese making landings in Chennai, Visakhapatnam, or Sri Lanka, and actually making large gains in British India cooperating with pro-independence, anti-British Indian forces under the command of Subhas Chandra Bose. Returning west, we'd find Turkey teetering on joining the Axis, who by this point would appear to be the inevitable victors. In our timeline, both Ataturk and his successor, Ismet Ononu, weren't on bad terms with the Axis, with Anonu considering joining them multiple times in the early stages of the war in order to regain historically Ottoman lands now held by the British and French. In our timeline, one of the biggest deterrents to Turkey joining the Axis was the looming Soviet threat right on their doorstep. In this timeline, that Soviet threat wouldn't exist as they're part of the Axis as well. With all this in mind, Turkey would likely join the Axis and focus their efforts on Greece as well as British colonies with the goal of controlling the Euphrates and Tigris rivers as well as taking the holy city of Jerusalem. In fact, in our timeline, Iraq actually unofficially joined the Axis after Rashid Ali was put in charge of the country with assistance from Germany and Italy. This led to the Anglo-Iraqi War which was essentially just a way to force Iraq into British hands in order to secure the oil fields in the region as well as to lock down the Middle East. While the UK would still initiate the Anglo-Iraqi war in this timeline, it wouldn't last long for the British due to the Axis-led Iraq receiving support from incoming Turkish troops. Because of that, Iraq would remain firmly in the Axis in this timeline and wouldn't be wrestled away by the British. Along with that, since France would be under Vichy rule by this point, 
They would allow the Turkish army unrestricted access into Syria in order to conquer Britain's Middle Eastern colonies, save for those in North Africa claimed by Italy. The Soviet Union would take notice of Turkish and Japanese ambitions in South Asia and would likely coordinate their efforts with them. I could see the USSR and Turkey jointly plowing their way through the British occupied zones of Iran, with the Soviets and Japanese now attempting to subjugate India. The Soviets would begin their side of the invasion of India in modern day Pakistan and would coordinate an effort with the Japanese to meet up halfway through the region. I would assume that both the Soviets and the Japanese would be working with pro Axis factions in India who believe that. Joining the alliance would help free India from British rule. These pro-Axis rebels would likely stage acts of terror against the British and Indian allied troops by destroying supply lines, bombing resource deposits, and overall making it difficult for the allies to fight back against the Soviets and the Japanese. By this point, the Japanese would likely begin discussions with the Soviets about a possible invasion of the US. In oh our timeline, shit. The Japanese actually made a small push to take the Alaskan Aleutian Islands, but I don't see that happening in this timeline, as they would realize that they couldn't hold it for long, and the Japanese wanted to reserve its resources. Instead, sometime around mid-1942, I would imagine the Japanese making a similar bombing of Pearl Harbor as in our timeline, except in this timeline, they would destroy the Hawaiian repair yards in order to keep the US out of the ocean for as long as possible. At the same time, Soviet warships would begin making their way over to Alaskan port cities. I cannot see the Japanese or the Soviets act have you all seen that uh, series in Amazon Prime? I think it's called The Man in the High Castle. It basically touches on a similar scenario, but without the Soviets joining the Axis. Actually making substantial gains in US territory besides certain colonies such as the Philippines. So for the time being, the war on the American front is confined to the ocean. Until a major shift happens, the main objective between both sides in the American theater of the war is to control the northern Pacific Ocean. While the US would want to help Britain in their fight against Germany, they wouldn't be able to send that much support due to their ongoing struggle against the Soviets and the Japanese. In our timeline, as the war approached its apparent end in Europe, last minute players joined in, hoping to gain from the post-war spoils, Spain being the most significant. In our timeline, Franco proposed joining the Axis, but only under the condition that Spain extract disproportionately large rewards for its efforts. Of course, Spain's help was rejected, but with the conflict favoring the Axis as far as it had, the Spanish might try to earn something for their participation in this timeline. One of the first things that Spain would do after being a oh, invade to the Axis is to target Britain's longtime ally of Portugal Damn, in our timeline. Bastards. Franco had grand Look at Switzerland there, bro. <laughs> is in the way of that, with Franco expressing his hate for Portugal on multiple occasions. I could see the Spanish government publishing propaganda across the media, painting the Portuguese in an extremely negative light, perhaps as an anti-Axis pro-British sympathizer. From there, Spain would likely do what Japan did in their invasion of Manchuria, that is, staging an attack so that the government has a valid reason to invade and subjugate the region. Back in Germany, the military higher-ups most likely would have abandoned Operation Sea Lion at this point due to Britain's plethora of funding to the Navy, repelling any German sea-based attacks. In response to this, the German nuclear bomb project would receive a surge of funding as they would likely see the use of nuclear bombs as the only way to force Britain into surrender at this point. By autumn of 1943, I could see the German atomic bomb project being given utmost importance by the Nazi government, having even recruited Soviet help by this point. For now, Germany just needs to keep control of their European holdings until they have developed a working nuclear bomb. In North America, the US Navy would be fighting a fierce battle against the Japanese in the mid-Pacific, as well as the Soviets in the northern Pacific. In this timeline, the number of resources going to the military would be significantly more than in our timeline due to fighting a much more vicious battle in the ocean. Because of this, I would expect the US to plunge into social disorder, as the people have been going without proper food for years now, as well as there not being any large military victories to keep morale up. This would all take a toll on FDR, <coughs> who was already stressed out enough and combined with he would have died earlier health issues, yeah. might die in early 1944 as a combination of all of these 
His vice president at the time, Henry Wallace, wanted to end the war as quickly as possible on our timeline, but didn't have the power to do so. In this timeline, after taking office as the 33rd president, Wallace would want to speed up the production of the atomic bomb, as he would more than certainly see it as a way to force the Axis into surrender. With the American public on the verge of breaking out into full-fledged chaos, he would know that the US needs to gain a major victory as soon as possible in order to get the major victory yeah. he needs. Wallace would likely try to spread even more American propaganda to keep the public off his back. Next, Wallace would try oh, to build United we resources win. for a full-scale invasion of Japan, similar to Operation propaganda Delphi man. in our timeline. <laughs> but despite the Allies' best efforts, they wouldn't stand much of a chance of victory by this point. By 1944, the German nuclear bomb project would have borne fruit, successfully testing a bomb in the Kazakh steppes of the Soviet Union. After completion of the bomb, Hitler would send an ultimatum to Britain, obviously not expecting it to be accepted due to Churchill's obsession with never with surrendering. Never surrendering. Hitler, <laughs> now in possession of atomic weaponry, uh, would Churchill, send a Messerschmitt ME-26 over Brighton carrying a nuclear bomb. As the Germans have been perfecting their bomb for years, the nuclear bomb would do substantial damage to the city, its industry, the population, and most importantly, the naval bases in the city. Before the British government can even comprehend what's going on, the Soviets would demand that the British cease all resistance in their Middle Eastern and South Asian colonies unless they want a second nuclear bomb to be dropped. The British, realizing that London could be the next atomic target, would sue for peace. The British have been on the losing side of the war for half a decade by this point. They've burned through the resources, the British public is in disarray, and their enemies now have city-destroying weapons. Because of this, the British would have no choice but to surrender. After the surrender oh, of Britain, the last major Allied power would be the US. Henry Wallace would speed up the American nuclear project in order to get a bomb as quickly as possible, as he knows that this is the only path to victory. After seeing Brighton get reduced to rubble, after months of hastily trying to create a nuclear weapon, the Americans would bear fruit in New Mexico. Although the American bomb is nowhere as the strong Manhattan as the German project. one, it's still an atomic bomb nonetheless. Making haste, the American bombs would be loaded onto B2. What would have happened? Would the Americans just like, give up R Alaska to the Russians and Hawaii to the Japanese? Or would the Japanese would want more? And the Russians as well. 29 bombers in Juneau and Honolulu and sent westward. The bombs stemming from Juneau would fly for days across the Russian Far East until it reaches Vladivostok, a Russian port city that would likely contain a great deal of the ships that have been harassing the Alaskan coast. Yep. The nuclear bomb would hit its target but wouldn't do that much damage as the bomb was created in a rush manner and had no time to be perfected. The bomb stemming from Honolulu would be aimed towards Tokyo, specifically targeting Emperor Hirohito, the man who the Japanese people saw as a god. If the Americans were to kill the emperor, Japanese morale would be considerably lowered and might even give them a chance in the Pacific. You think so? But this would not happen as the Japanese fortifications in the Pacific would be able to repel the B-29. I mean, there's an argument to be made that if the Japanese killed the emperor, they would have become more brutal. I mean, that's why they allowed him to keep his position in the first place, because well, the Japanese people just loved him so much. Carrying the nuke with an anti-aircraft gun shooting it down somewhere between Hawaii and Japan. Back in Russia, Stalin would be going ballistic over the atomic bombing of Vladivostok and would want to seek revenge against the Americans. The Germans would aid him in this, as they would also want to knock the US out of the war. The Germans would load one atomic bomb in Magadan, Russia, and another in German-occupied Venice, France, and send them towards the US. The bomb stemming from Russia would be aimed towards Los Angeles, oh, with no. the intention to destroy as much as possible as revenge for Vladivostok. The bomb stemming from France would likely be aimed towards New York City, America's cultural center, in order to absolutely crush US morale. Both bombs would make contact with their intended targets, causing colossal amounts of damage to both cities. Henry Wallace, now realizing that the US has no chance of victory, after seeing two of their biggest cities destroyed, would surrender to the Axis. After years of fighting, and four cities destroyed by atomic bombs, World War II would conclude with an Axis victory. The first major change after the conclusion of the war would be the <coughs> redrawing of world borders. In Europe, Germany would most likely turn the Low Countries into fascist puppets while annexing a great deal of Central Europe. Despite what many think would happen, Germany would not annex Alsace-Lorraine. This is because France, 
under Vichy rule, along with all of its colonies, are pretty much already under the direct rule of Berlin, causing no need for annexations, as Germany already has everything it needs from France. The Soviet Union would likely puppet a great deal of Eastern Europe under communist rule just like in our timeline. However, the Soviets wouldn't be able to exert control over as much of Eastern Europe as they did in our timeline due to So pretty much the countries that sort of survived Switzerland, of course, which makes you wonder what if they invaded Switzerland? Because they actually thought about it. Um, in a way to get around France defend defenses, they thought about invading Switzerland and going instead of going the whole Benelux way, they could have gone to Switzerland. But of course they decided that crossing Luxembourg and Belgium was much easier than crossing the Alps in Switzerland. But still, you know, they consider it uh, Ireland untouched, Sweden untouched, Greece touched but at least it survived man germany having already established their own sphere of influence over the region since turkey fought alongside the axis against greece turkey would likely receive crete along with some of if not all of the aegean islands from greece in asia japan would establish complete dominance over korea eastern china the malay archipelago the philippines southeast, southeast asia, asia yeah. and possibly even southern india when it comes to australia or new zealand i don't expect them to come under japanese control but rather independent nations that are within the japanese sphere of influence the soviet union would also make massive gains in asia likely occupying all of iran afghanistan and the northern indian region of kashmir along with a great deal of modern day pakistan i don't expect the soviet union to actually annex these regions but rather occupy them in a similar fashion to the eastern block where the Soviet Union has free range to do whatever it wants within the occupied borders, most notably giving it access to warm water ports in order to end the centuries old Russian problem of ports freezing over yep. for half the year. In the Middle East, the biggest changes would come in the form of Turkey receiving most British colonies in the region, the Sinai Peninsula as well as French held Syria. France and her colonies were under complete German rule during most of the war, and I don't see that changing for the time being. Syria served no importance to Germany, and Germany would definitely want to keep Turkey as an ally, as they are now the most powerful country in the Middle East. Because of this, Germany might force Vichy France to give Syria over to Turkey so it can connect with the rest of Turkey's new borders. Most notably, all of Iraq and the Levant would come under Turkish control, with the Turkish government planning to fully incorporate them into Turkey within a couple of decades. Throughout the rest of the world, there wouldn't be very many changes, except for colonial possessions changing hands, most notably those in Africa, with the colonies of Namibia, Tanzania, Cameroon being taken from Britain, oh my along God. with a great deal of minor Going back to Germany. World. While many would expect Belgian colonies such as the Congo to be given to Germany, <laughs> I wouldn't expect this to be the case. Belgium is essentially under the direct control of Germany, meaning that Germany has free range to do whatever they want in its colonies, causing no need for it to be handed over to Germany. In North America, the Aleutian Islands might actually go to the Soviet Union, as the USSR captured a great deal of the islands during the war with no intention of returning them once the war concluded. Along with losing the Aleutian Islands to the USSR, the US would more than certainly be forced to hand over Guam, Hawaii, and all other Pacific possessions to the Japanese. After the world borders are redrawn, I would expect a great deal of the Allied powers to come under occupation, just like the Axis powers were in our timeline. For example, Germany would likely completely occupy the UK, and may even give independence to Scotland, or give Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland. While this seems preposterous, this isn't actually as far-fetched as it seems. During World War II, both Northern Ireland and Scotland were feeling resentment against the English for dragging them into like a always. conflict that they feel that they shouldn't be a part of. Germany was Nothing new there. Of their resentment, and by releasing them from the UK, could possibly gain the new nation of Scotland or completely united Ireland as potential future allies, while at the same time weakening their greatest adversary in Europe. I would also expect the US to come under occupation, with the oh, Soviet Union shit. occupying Alaska. Japan annexing Hawaii and occupying the Pacific coast, and Germany occupying the east coast along with the upper midwest. Obviously, no annexations in these occupied territories will be made. Yeah, this is some um, man in the high castle stuff. This is the, what, the great, greater Nazi Reich, and this is the Japanese Pacific states. You know, watch that show. It's interesting. The last season is kind of shitty, but the the first two or three seasons are, are, are worth it. And it, it, 
it gives you a real perspective of the people that would be living in it in such scenario like i'm not gonna Except spoil Hawaii, it to you but for the time being all of these regions are under the direct control of the axis yeah puppet the states i guess following the end of the war will likely be characterized by the war tribunals for allied leaders with military and political leaders from the US, UK, and many other allied nations facing trials similar to those in Nuremberg or Tokyo in our timeline. At the very least, I would expect Henry Wallace, whoever his vice president is, Douglas MacArthur, Winston Churchill, and Alan Brooke to be tried and punished for their actions in the war. Heavy emphasis would be put on the American detainment of Japanese Americans as a way to consolidate world oh, rights yeah, that's the Axis true, powers, man. just like the Allies did with Damn. the Holocaust in our timeline. As for the Holocaust itself, along with other Axis crimes such as the Nanking Massacre, they would only become a footnote in the overall history of the war. This is because most of the emphasis would be put on crimes committed by the Allied powers, such as the previously mentioned American detainment of Japanese Americans. Of course, Axis war crimes wouldn't be completely lost to history, but rather be given very little attention in the overall picture of the war, with most crimes of the war associated with the Allies instead. Beyond that, it would be impossible to say what would happen next. Maybe a Cold War emerges between Germany and Russia? Maybe Britain and the US fall to fascism? Maybe a third world war breaks out? Oh yeah, for sure. Well, I have a little, little theory, because you gotta remember that uh, Hitler and Stalin were both in massive megalomaniacs. Um, the Japanese and the Germans thought they were racially superior, and the Germans particularly thought the Slavs were subhuman. I mean, this stuff, I don't think it would disappear just because they, they, they took part in, in the same war. So they probably would go against each other, you know. I mean, Stalin loves territory and conquest. Uh, Hitler loves that as well. So they would eventually go against each other. Uh, I also don't see the... the the Germans, sorry, the British and the Americans just sitting down and taking all this. You got to remember, the Americans own a lot of weapons, the citizens, and they know how to fight. And the, the, the American culture is very different to the European culture. So whatever uh, puppet government would be in America, I think it'd be very hard fought by the American population. Definitely, most definitely. And... As well, I just don't think that you got to remember the only country that sort of became more powerful after World War II was the U.S. and kind of the Soviet Union. But like France and Britain, they won, but they were deeply devastated by the war. They lost their colonies shortly after the war. So it's hard to imagine that really Germany and the Soviet Union, that after losing so many men and dedicating so much part of their economy to the war, would they really be that strong? Would they really be able to hold that much territory after losing a bunch of men and resources and economic uh, resources? I don't think so. And remember, we're talking about India, Iran, America, Europe. All these territories with billions of people inside them are not going to sit down and take it. And a debilitated Germany, a debilitated Soviet Union, would I don't think they would be extremely able to hold all those territories. But I don't know. I mean, I really enjoyed this video. It was really fun. I love alternate history because it gives us a, a, an option to see what could have happened and what could have been. And I'm seeing many of them here. Uh, let's go back to the in-game. Irish reunification, the Anglosphere, Operation Downfall. What if Rome would have survived? Alternate history is really fun. Now I see why you guys 